All right. Welcome to the Quest for Glory 3 commentary. First and foremost, if you haven't already, uh, go ahead and please click that like and subscribe button. And if you're so inclined, feel free to share this link around, whether it's social media or wherever. That would greatly be appreciated. Um, I've been spending a lot of time on this channel doing a bunch of stuff. So it'd be cool to keep getting more subscribers. I am trying to hit the 1000 mark because at 1000, if I meet the other requirements, I can then begin to try to monetize this channel, which would be amazing to be able to make a little bit of extra money on a hobby that I love doing. Um, but even if I don't even ever hit that 1000 uh, subscriber mark, which I hope is not the case, I hope one day enough people decide to like the channel while I'm still on this earth. That would be great. All right, but before I start talking about the game, can I talk about real quick how Lori Cole herself commented on my video post that I posted on Facebook? I mean, listen, listen, I know. I have her as a friend on Facebook. I see that she takes amazing photos. So yes, yes, I do know she is human, uh, but she's also someone that I aspired to be way back when. <laughs> I, uh, one day, uh, I drove up from San Diego with my mother, father, and our family dog in hopes of entering the customer service at Sierra with the wild dreams that I would be able to somehow convince them to allow me to become a game designer eventually. I'd already had two game designs, like, in my pocket, ready to be like, this is what I got, Sierra. And they were modeled very much after Sierra games. They took place in a prehistoric setting. I may have talked about it somewhere on my channel before, probably on the Sierra Chess 10th anniversary. I probably talked about my game idea that I had. It was a prehistoric setting because it was like the one thing that Sierra had not covered. You know, they had the modern setting with Police Quest. They had the comedy with Leash Suit Larry in the modern setting. They had, you know, futuristic with Space Quest. They had fantasy with King's Quest. They had, uh, you know, like the role playing, the character building kind of aspect through Quest for Glory. So the one thing they hadn't really done in terms of an adventure game was something prehistoric. And I had two games, basically the original and already a sequel plan. So I was ready to be a game designer for Sierra. Um, unfortunately, I didn't end up at Sierra and thus I actually never became a game designer for them, obviously. Uh, but that dream has always been there. Like even to this day, I still think back of like, what if? What if I had stuck with it and did try to get in at Sierra? What if I had, you know, chased this dream up the uh, up the tree, if you will, to see how far I can get with it? But sadly, it did not happen. Uh, but for all the social media evils, um, as people say, um, this ability to be able to interact with people whom I've always admired, whether it's you know Laurie and Corey Cole. Al Lowe, or even Greg Johnson, who made a totally different game called Toe Jam and Earl. All of these people I've been able to interact with and get to know uh, much better through, you know, basically Facebook in this regard. So it's actually been pretty amazing. All right. <clears throat> I'm done gushing. Uh, let's, let, let's talk about the actual video. The reason why we're actually really here is to talk about for Quest for Glory 3. Um... One of the things I notice is right off the bat, it's interesting that in the flashback, uh, where we start seeing the retelling of the hero's encounter with Adavis, there's no gargoyle there. When you actually play Quest for Glory 2, which this thing is referencing, there is a gargoyle there. He is there, and if you fight him, it basically burns time and allows Adavis to pull the victory. So you kind of need to pull away from the uh, gargoyle to basically win the game and defeat Adavis. So it's weird that in this flashback that we see, we do not see the gargoyle being present. So anyway, first things first, wait a minute, would that be second since I already talked about the cargo? Would that be third because I already talked about the Lori Cole thing? Anyway, um, if you saw my previous posting um, on Facebook or even on here on the YouTube channel, I had posted that I had hit a game ending bug when I was playing my Paladin through Quest for Glory 3. And what happens is um, when you reach when you reach the Simbani tribe, there's a leopard person who is the enemy of the Simbani, and eventually a leopard person is caught. 
and you need to basically find out where their village is so you can get the Spear of Death back and basically restore perhaps the possibility of peace between the Simbani and the Leopard people and basically also the Liantars from Tarna because there is a war that is on the brisk of just brewing and just erupting. So you need to get this Dispel Potion together from the guy that's in Tarna. When you dispel the Leopard person that's in this cage, you discover that they are an attractive, but still very angry female. The chief explains that, uh, you know, many people in his tribe are seeking to make her a bride now. Which, okay, I felt that was a little odd, since the Simbani and the Leopard people have been bitter enemies for a long time. Like, you know, the, the Leopard people use magic, the Simbani don't. The Leopard people stole the Spear of Death. Uh, the Simbani stole their, you know, magic drums. You know, so there was clearly a lot of tension between these two. So it's kind of odd that now that they see this Leopard woman is an attractive woman, the warriors of the Simbani village are like, hey, I want to make her my bride. So that seemed a little bit off and a little odd. Um, but even the chief, um, I believe his name is pronounced Laban, L-A-I-B-O-N, might be mispronouncing that. I am notorious for mispronouncing odd names. Um, he doesn't want his son. Here's another name I'm about to mispronounce. And I pronounce it Yesufu, Y-E-S-U-F-U. So, it, or it could be yes, U F U, yes, U F U. I don't know. Anyway, so his son wants to marry her as well, but the chief doesn't because he is also under the impression that you know the leopard people are bitter enemies. Like, no, my son shouldn't marry her. So you basically enter in this competition, and ideally you'll win the competition. But when the chief asks what you want, and like one of them is you can select, you know, you want to have a council with them. Or another one is you want the drums, so basically you can try to get the spear back and give them the drums back, maybe bring some peace. Um, if you do, if you select either one of those, it essentially breaks the game. Because what happens next is you'll get the thing that you requested, whether it is that, you know, that conference or the drums. And then you are basically forced out of Laban's hut. And whenever you try to turn around to go back in, the um, the guard that's outside the hut will lower his spear and say, now is not a good time to enter. And so at first I thought, okay, so I've triggered the thing. So now, you know, you know, I've dispelled her. Now I've talked to him. I've gotten the drums. There's probably something else I need to do in the game before they'll let me in to basically talk to the chief. So I spent a long time, a very, 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 very long time wandering around the game Wondering if there was something else I needed to trigger. So I found a few things. So like I went to I went back to Tarna because by this point I had already gone to I'm just gonna call it the Tree of Life, where you have to go up this massive long tree, and I've gotten the gem that was up there. So when I go back to Tarna and I go to the top of the temple, you do this whole ritual where you have to select these various symbols like the sword and the cup and the key. And after you answer five or six questions about, you know, your best friend is about to be sentenced and you're appointed to be the judge how do you do this and it gives you like four or five options to select from you answer all these questions and basically the you get you get basically a reading back as to the type of person that you are and so i thought okay maybe that's the trigger i needed so i make my way all the way back to the simbani village fight a bunch of things along the way and i get there and still they won't let me in i'm like okay so there's something else i probably still need to do so I make my way back to Tarna and I start wandering around. Eventually it hits night in Tarna and I happen to walk into the marketplace and the thief that you literally stop at the very beginning of the game, he's there and he starts asking you for help. Now I'm playing a paladin and at the time I thought, well, pfft, would a paladin really want to associate with someone who is considered a thief? But I thought he's here for a reason. Let's do this. I might lose some paladin points by talking to this guy, but let's see what happens. So I talked to him and he basically says, hey, I need help. You know, no one talks to me. I can't get food. I'm starving. Can't even get out of this city. Um, so you give him food and stuff like that. And you meet him for a couple times and eventually you keep talking about rumors. And he tells you information that you need to tell Rakish. So you eventually go back to Rakish and say, hey, here's some things I've heard. And you'll get points for that. And I thought, ah, okay, that has to be the trigger that I needed to do. So I walk all the way back to the Simbani village, go up to the chief's hut, 
the guard puts his spear down and says, now is not a good time. And I'm like, okay, there's something else I have to do. And I am not kidding when I say I went to the top left corner of the map, clicked to the right, clicked over to the left, and I literally made my way slowly down the map. Hitting everything I could, every monster in the way, every little thing I could find. And then I went to the next screen over where the Sabani village is, and I did the same thing, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Then I went into the jungle, back and forth, back and forth. And by now, it's literally like on day 42, and a lot of my stats are at 300, which was great. But couldn't find anything else, so I go back to the Simpani village, try to go in during the day. That was not a good time. I'm like, oh, come on. So I wait for night, go into Uhura's hut, talk to her, um, a few things there. She talks about wooing um, the the prisoner, and I get it. you hear the ding, so obviously you get a point for that. But then after that, the wooing conversation breaks. So nothing you do with Uhura after you after she talks about wooing works. So if you click anywhere on her, click on um, the baby, nothing. Nothing works in her hut after she mentions wooing. So then you have to exit the hut and come back and then talk to her again. And if you hit anything about wooing, it stops the conversation tree again. So clearly the conversation tree with the Liban and Uhura, they are very broke in this game. So... I was stuck. So I finally gave up. I, I, <laughs> I made a video that I posted to YouTube and posted on Facebook and this and basically said, you know, Hey, um, am I missing something? Here's all the things that I did. I think I hit a bug. And eventually a few people were like, Oh, you have to give the prisoner a gift. But if you try to give the prisoner a gift before you've actually done the, uh, bride price thing and basically officially had uh, live and say that you're married, Whoever's there, whether it's yes, Yosefu or Uhura or just the average normal guard guy, they won't let you give her anything. You can't give her a dagger. You can't. You can try to give her the the lion token, but she'll look at it and then look away and just growl at you. So there's nothing you can do with the prisoner at this point. So I was like, okay. No one seems to know what's going on. So I Google it. I'm finally, like I'm just gonna Google it, and I find a number of threads that talk about. Hey, if you're playing the fighter or a paladin, because of the contest you have to enter to try to win her hand, it's unique to the fighter and paladin, you are going to probably hit a bug. And so reading in it, they said, hey, here's a few things you can try to basically get around this bug. And so I tried a few of those things, but nothing would work. Um, I think that once you basically hit this bug, once you reach this game breaking bug and hit one of those triggers that breaks, whether it's talking to Uhura that, with the woo thing, or if you have like the dinosaur horn before you're supposed to have it. Um, I do not know what the game breaking bug is. I have no idea. But so what I ended up doing after trying all these things, um, I was considering just dropping Quest for Glory 3 and then just play a different CR game and maybe come back to Quest for Glory 3 and instead of playing it through DOSBox, playing it through ScumVM because ScumVM talks about how they have these extra patches that, you know, they fix a number of the bugs that were in the game, but that would require starting over because ScumVM and DOSBox back and forth, they are not compatible with one another. So you can't take a DOSBox game and use it for ScumVM and vice versa. You can't use a ScumVM save game to work with DOSBox. So would have meant starting all over and after spending as much time as I did on Quest for Glory 3 I wasn't sure if I was ready to do that. So I ended up restoring all the way back before I even reached the Sampani village. Like I, I reached it with um, Rikish but then I left right after that. So as soon as I entered I basically walked back out and I basically did a number of things I could outside and I went to the Sampani village and I went through it and I was like, okay, I don't have the dinosaur horn. Like I've killed a few dinosaurs in my day already, but I didn't loot them for their horn. So I know that that's not gonna break the game. So I went up to the guy, 
did the whole thing with dispelling her and says, you know what, to prove that you are a warrior, I need one of these horns to prove that you are man enough to be one of the Simbani warrior. So I was like, cool, now I can go out, walk around till I find that dinosaur, which did not take long, got his horn, walked back, handed it to him, and he was like, cool, now you're a part of it. And I was like, great. And so I did the contest, came back, and he basically says, what do you want? Like the drum, the con uh, the uh, conference, whatever. And I was like, okay, the drum. So he gives me the drum. I am forced out of the hut. And when I try to go back in, he doesn't let me in again. And so I was like, you have got to be kidding me. I hit the bug again. So then I restore again further back to right before I get to the Spani village. I do everything all over again. I can give him the horn. I don't get the horn until I need it. I give him the horn when he asks for it. But when he asks what I want, I actually broke out of that conversation and then I talked to his son Yasifu. And when I went back to Liban, there was a different conversation tree. Now the option to choose a conference or a drum wasn't there. There was things about the bride price and marriage and stuff like that. So I clicked marriage. And sure enough, I hear the bling, and he says, great, she's now your wife, after I've won the competition and all that. And I look in my inventory, the spear, the five sheepskin, and the robe are all gone, and I have the drums in my inventory now. So now, without having to tell him that I needed the drums, I've already got the drums in my inventory. I had to break out of that conversation to talk to him. And I have a feeling because I did not have the horn before I needed it when I talked to him and all that stuff. I hadn't talked to Uhura about the wooing thing yet. So I have a feeling by avoiding those things, that may have been what prevented me from hitting the bug on my third attempt <laughs> of trying to beat this uh, thing. Uh, but I can't confirm. I do not know if that's what it was because I have no idea what the bug is. However, like I said, uh, there are a number of patches that I've discovered, um, but I think once you hit the bug, those patches can't fix it. They won't fix it retro. You have to basically I think the best thing is you run these patches and then you run a clean game, which is, I think, the benefit of if you use it through um, ScumVM, because ScumVM um, unpackages those patches for you at the start of the game, so it should fix it as soon as you get to the Sabani village, all of those bugs should be taken care of, which is cool. Um, and had I been smart enough to think, um, if you go to crhelp.com, um, on that page, I talk about CR Help all the time, if you didn't know that from my other videos. I'm a co-admin on the forums, but it's actually uh, Andrew who runs the site, and he, does, he has an incredible amount of stuff on there that you should definitely, definitely check out if you go to crhelp.com. Check out the site, check out the forums. There's a lot of cool people on there. Um, but yeah, so had I gone there and looked, he actually has a number of patches for Quest for Glory 3 that I actually never applied to my game prior to reaching the Simbani Village. I downloaded them after and then tried to see if that would fix it. And you'll see in my playthrough where you'll see a note at the bottom in the commentary. I think it's also in the regular version too, but in the commentary version where it says, try to go back and use my old save game to see if this would work nope <laughs> so i did try to use where i had all my stats built up to 300 to see if i could get around this whole marriage thing versus losing some of that work of wandering around for 30 days in game building up my stats trying to figure out what i needed to do to trigger to be allowed in the uh, hut um but yeah it was fine um just so you know, if you play Quest for Glory 3, either use ScumVM or head to sierrahelp.com and get those patches before you play, and you can play through DOSBox. Should be just fine. I can't confirm that because I ended up just restoring and finding some weird quirky way around that whole marriage thing. But there you have it. So in case you get stuck, this is probably what you're going to have to do as well. <laughs> um, hey, let's see... While I'm on the subject of bugs, um, there's another one I want to talk about. So from time to time after a battle, and I think it was only specifically out in the savannah, I don't recall if this happened in the jungle, but the game would sometimes freeze on you when you, you know, after the battle, you win, yay. Um, when you try to exit, it would just lock up. You'd see, you know, the hero would get to like only part of his body walking off the screen if you're walking down, which was the quickest way typically to get off of that screen. It would freeze. 
And so because that kept happening to me, I thought, okay, well, now I'm going to walk either left or right because maybe something about going south to exit the screen quickly is making it lock up. That made me encounter a different bug in which the hero would literally walk into the sunset. And I don't mean he's just riding off on a horse. He literally would start walking upwards. You see him walking up on the savannah. He's walking up on the mountains. And then he's walking up through the sky. And from time to time, um, what would happen is it would sit there for a minute. And it would eventually go through so you'd see the map again. However, when you get to the map, um, all it did was basically lock up. So it would eventually go to the map, but then it just locks up. You just have the beetle and you couldn't click on anything, move anything. Um, but a lot of times he would just walk up into the sky and it would just lock up there. You'd never go to the map screen. You just see him disappear into the sky and that's it. He just stops. Taken away by UFOs or Roger Wilco, whatever the case might be, the game would just break there. And it was because of these types of bugs. Like after I'd already dealt with the whole um, figuring out how to get around the wedding thing, or not the wedding, I guess the marriage thing, because it's not really a wedding. Once I figured out the marriage thing, and I'd lost all that time of building up my stats, because I'd got restored so far back and just went straight through trying to get this, what I ended up doing is I thought, oh, you know what, I'm going to try to build up some of these stats now, because now that, you know, I have her and I gave her the gifts and she's wandered off, I, I have time to do whatever I want. But these bugs with the um, combat came up a few more times after that, and I thought, you know what? <laughs> after that whole marriage bug, and now I'm seeing the the combat bug, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go through and beat this game. So I ended up just making my way through Quest for Glory three, and I thought I'm just gonna make up for building up my stats, and I'll just do it in Quest for Glory four. Now I realize I've spent quite a bit of time talking about bugs in this game and you might start to think wow <laughs> this guy he did not like quest for glory 3 and you would actually be very very incorrect let me say this i actually enjoyed this game despite all the bugs i kept hitting despite all those bugs i kept hitting i enjoyed this game much more than i did quest for glory 2 story-wise I felt there. Um, I was pulled into this world more because there were definitely. It felt different when you go from Quest for Glory one to Quest for Glory two. The yeah, the setting was different because you're now out in a desert and stuff like that. And you know there are the kata and stuff like that. And you do get like this whole Arabian feel to the game. But that was it. Like you know the visual was there, but I didn't feel I was pulled into a different area. With this game, I felt like there were way more NPCs to engage with, and each one of them was very different. Even the, um, even the guy who makes the health potions and the, uh, like the dispel potion, that guy, even though he's kind of like, hey, I'm totally far out, dude. Like, yeah, you know, even though he was that hippie kind of guy, which was fine, um, he was the only one that felt out of place, which is again, that's that's fine. He was one character that seemed really weird. But I would rather take him, and hopefully this doesn't upset anyone, but I have never been a fan of Keep On Laughing, the character, the guy who sells the spells and stuff like that, or that type of character who is so over-the-top funny that it feels like it's trying too hard. And oftentimes when Keep On Laughing would say something, it was such a weird, cryptic riddle of just trying to rhyme that oftentimes, to me, it didn't make a lot of sense. It would just sound like words to say words to make them rhyme. Um, I know a lot of times he was giving subtle clues in there, but it was just too much for me with Keep On Laughing. So the potion guy in Quest for Glory 3, to me, was way more tolerable than uh, anything like Keep On Laughing. Um so that was awesome like i felt like there were way more characters so like when you're in tarna there's more characters to talk to um even <laughs> even the uh when you're in the uh i guess you want to call it an inn where you go to order food you can flirt with the waitress and she has witty comments like my husband loves it when i tell him the things that you say to me just those little things were really really great 
Um, and then when you get to some body village, like I said, not only do you have like Laiban, who is very, 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 very difficult to talk to, <laughs> but you have his son who's in the game as well. And then you have Uhura. Um, there is a leopard woman, but she's kind of not really part of the Simbani village, even though you do talk to her there. But I think what I really enjoyed is while you're at the at the Simbani village, you are you are totally pulled into the culture of it all, right? Because you're entering a contest, um, you're doing something to become honorable with their warrior type uh, belief. So you're really, your character is really integrated into their setting and how they work and the things that they do. And one of the other things that I really, 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 really liked about this game is that, um, you know, you have the Liontars who have very much like, a, I want to say like an Egyptian type feeling, like every, their structures, you know, they have the temples that are Egyptian and they, even the symbols above the, um, like the inn and the, uh, the potion shop and whatnot. They're all very Egyptian looking. And then you go to the Simbani village and you get what I would say is very much like this African, like savanna kind of wildlife out there. You know, you're out there hunting for animals and stuff like that. And you're, you're caring for your cattle. So you have two very different worlds right there that you are engaging with in both. And one of the really, really cool things, and I don't know if the Coles looked something up in terms of like, doing actual languages but for example when you talk to them they'll often say something and the words will be like something that you don't understand because it is a uh, part of their dialect so for example uh uhura when you're near the spear thing and she probably says it in other places but i remember during the spear thing she said kwa hiri hero which is k-w-a space h-e-r-i and then hero so i have no idea what kwa hiri means or if I'm even pronouncing it right, it may be a actual language that they're basing this off of. I assume it means something like good day hero, you know, qua hiri hero, good day hero. Um, but she could be, say, be saying something in a foul language. I have no idea. Um, but I thought that was really great that, you know, you definitely feel like they had their own language versus like in Quest for Glory 2. I don't recall anyone. You know what? They probably did. Actually, I think they did in Quest for Glory too. They did have like a uh, uh, Arabic language when like the guard would talk to you. So it is there too, I guess. But I know I definitely picked up on it way more in Quest for Glory 3 because I think it's said more frequently, right? Like every time you go to the Sampani village, there's that elder who's standing outside up on the mountain and he greets you with typically their native tongue and, you know, with a comma hero or whatever. So you, you're seeing it way more, I think, or I just caught it way more in this game. It definitely pulled me more in this game than it did in Quest for Glory 2, clearly, because I had to think about it for Quest for Glory 2 to see if they actually did say it. Now, I'll say this. From the Elder, who's standing outside the village, one of the quirks that I wish, I totally wish they would have done here, is if you do not click inside the village, like from that view... You just go outside if you click elsewhere because it happened to me so many times that i click basically kind of the middle of the screen down thinking he'll just walk right off the screen heading south no no what he would do is he would walk right to the right make his way down and then go back into the sabani village to exit from here you have to click the far left southern corner uh so that the hero walks to the left off screen I do wish on that screen they had just made it so if you want to go into the Sabani village, you click on the Sabani village. If you want to go anywhere else, you just click anywhere on that rock formation and the hero walks south or east or west to go back into the savannah. Um, so that was a little bit crazy. And also in the, um, I'm just going to call it the tree of life, that big tree you have to climb up and get the gems and the, the water, um, this screen here. There were times that I was just like there where I was trying to um, exit, like I was trying to go down. So I'd click a little bit south to, just to make the hero walk down the path. And instead, he would walk back inside. And it's not similar to when you go in the Sabani. It's not just a quick entrance. He makes his way down when you go to Sabani. And here he makes his way up and 
curves around a few things and ends up near at the edge of this little lake. Um, so I do wish that those were just either a quick <laughs> entrance exit kind of thing versus, you know, that long curve. There's a leopard person. I was going to see if that's where I die. The uh, audio might be a little off because of when I talked about Lori Cole commenting on my thing. But anyway, <laughs> um, another thing I wanted to talk about was like Manu. Um, he's the talking monkey. I thought he was absolutely great. This is what I mean. There were so many more characters that I felt were memorable in this game. I love that when you drag him to the lost city, he's complaining the entire way like, Hey, Manu not happy. Manu take human friend back to tree. Let's go back to tree and swing on vines. Manu no like the lost city. I thought that was really, really great because it showed so much character in his dialogue as you're marching towards the lost city that he's going to guide you to. Um, admittedly, prior to getting to the lost city, when he does lead me to the center of his own city, I did try to walk off the screen like, okay, cool, we stopped halfway, we just got to keep walking. Um, it, and he would keep yelling at me like, wait, don't leave. And I'm like, well, I'm not trying to leave, I'm trying to get to this, I'm trying to get to your city. And it took me a moment to think, wait a minute, he kept saying that he always sticks to the trees because there's like things on the ground that will eat the monkeys. And I thought, wait, I probably need to climb that tree that he's sitting on. And I thought, well, what if I have no climb skill? Can I still climb this tree? And I think I had a climb skill of like 10. So it would not have been an issue. But I wonder if you have a climb skill of zero, if you could still just automatically climb this giant tree without an issue, which would seem kind of odd because if you have a climb skill of zero, how, how come you're climbing? I guess you could still do something even though you're not skilled at because, I mean, that's most of my life. Um, <laughs> one of the other characters that I thought was really, really great was the aforementioned thief. The thief that you catch or basically put a stop to at the start of the game. Well, hopefully you catch him. I do believe he can get away technically. But hopefully you are able to catch him and you catch him and then you go to his trial and then, you know, they banish him. And then, like I said, if you go back to Tarna later, I'm not sure what the sequence is that triggers it, but he will be in the marketplace at night. And so if you talk to him there, you actually really get to know him. Like, he's like, I don't understand why you do this. Like, why do you stick your neck out for people that you barely even know? And I thought that was really, really great because it was showing someone who at this point seems to just, even through his own dialogue, he says, you know, I'm only watching out for myself and no one else. However, when it comes to the end of the game, if you haven't beat this game, just know that a bunch of stuff is going to get spoiled if it hasn't already been spoiled for you. You should play this game before you watch this. Um, at the end, he's one of the people that comes with the others to fight the demons. And when he gets there, he's like, you know what? Mm, I am not ready to fight a demon. Yeah, like, I'm out. And so basically Manu is the one who takes his place. And he's like, what? A monkey fighting demons? That's ridiculous. And Rikish is like, well, it's not about like the odds. It's about the honor of fighting and trying to do what is right. And he's like, yeah, no, I don't get that. So shortly after that, you end up, you and the others end up fighting doppelgangers of yourself. And let me say this, like when I was fighting my doppelganger, I was pretty confident I was going to win this fight. Like I thought this was going to be easy. I have been slaying everything with very, very little trouble very little trouble but when it came to this doppelganger i was like i'm about to die like this guy is not going down as quickly as this giant dinosaur that's really feared which makes sense because it is a doppelganger of you so it should be someone who is very heroic very tough to take down and so as this battle's raging on suddenly and they did it so well you see the thief appear behind the doppelganger and he stabs him and he says, you know, go ahead and go, I'll take care of this. Which shows a moment that the thief, who had no honor, suddenly had, you know, the most courageous honor. Like, he only had a dagger. He wasn't, he didn't understand why people were fighting this war that he had nothing to do with. But he realized in that moment, he needed to do something. If he had any hopes of, like, things not going horrible in the world. So I thought that was a really, really cool redemption moment uh, for that thief to uh, basically step up and, you know, take part of the battle. So I thought that was just another really, really cool moment. Uh, oh, I know what I want to talk about. The contest stuff. 
So the spear throwing and the balance bridge is what I'm going to call it. When you have your skill, uh, which is in the control panel, uh, if you have your skill up, um, you'll see that the flag for the spear throwing, the flag is blowing. Now, granted, probably because of the speed and how many CPUs I have the game running at, that flag is moving so quickly that it, it is essentially pointless because normally you would, you know, you would adopt. So if the flag is blowing directly to your right, you would adjust a little more to the left so that when you throw the spear, it compensates for the wind and moves in a little bit to the right and should you know, strike the target you're going for. But probably because of the speed of modern machines and how fast you can make these things uh, move, especially through DOSBox by increasing or decreasing the cycles that are being used, um, that flag is moving so quickly that it's it's impossible to use. Now, to be fair, when this game was designed, what? 35, like 35 years ago or something like that? Obviously, computers were not this fast, right? So they clearly didn't... They were never compensating for this kind of game, uh, this type of speed of a computer. You know, back then, you know, they were... These games were basically for high-end machines for the most part. Um, so th in a modern computer, that flag with the spear isn't all that useful, which can make the contest when you're, when you're going for the Leopard Woman's hand... Um, not her hand physically, but her hand in marriage, I should say. Uh, when you're doing it, it's it's pretty difficult to nail. And especially if you have the CPU cycles turned really high, you'll notice the first time I'm doing it where I have my hero built out and not realizing I'm about to hit a bug. Um, you can see that when it's still, I can still manage to hit the thing because it's still pretty easy, even if you have your skill up. But when it gets to the moving, uh, moving spear target, that thing is flying so fast <laughs> that it is nearly impossible to time when to throw that spear. You'll see that when I restored for the back to try to get around the bug, I set it to um, like a default CPU, so it try to exactly emulate what a you know what a 486 machine that would normally run this machine would operate speed wise, and that moving target was much slower. The flag still moved a little fast, but overall it was much more useful if you set it to that speed. However, the balance beam, that balance beam was atrocious for me. So it is a game of balance and counterbalance, right? So like if someone jumps up, what you want to do is you want to kneel down so that you're not in a standing position when he hits the board and bounces you off. That part's easy. So if someone jumps, you kneel down to counterbalance, or you can jump up to try to make them kneel down. Easy. Now there is also the object, because there are two boards, that you can lean to the left or lean to the right to try to throw someone else so that the board kind of tosses them to the left or tosses them to the right, and you have to counterbalance to that movement. Now again, probably because the computer speed running at the speed that it's running, it is very, very difficult to tell the difference between when they are leaning to the left or when they're leaning to the right because it happens so quickly that counterbalancing it is very 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 difficult so you'll see when i did it through my regular playthrough i just i did it and i ended up losing i think i won the spear contest but then i lost the balance contest um so i ended up restoring and i just knocked the skill level to zero and so if you do that the spear contest becomes extremely easy um, the wind is no longer a factor. The flag is just straight flat down. And then for the balance beam, you don't even have to do anything. So normally you have a, a control thing in the lower right where you're hitting jump up, jump down, uh, balance left or right. Um, but with the skill lowered all the way, that is no longer there and it just does it automatically and you will automatically win uh, the balance beam. So that was kind of cool to do. So if you're not a fan of arcade segments, if you will, um, you can bypass that by just putting your skill all the way to zero on the uh, control panel area where you would normally like save the game or restore the game. So that was an option. And then, uh, let's see. Oh, now I remember something else. So one of the things that was a bummer about Quest for Glory 3 
was the fact that so like for in quest for glory one and in quest for glory two both of them um in in the combat you could have multiple enemies so um for example in quest for glory one the main place you could have multiple enemies is it at that goblin camp so sometimes you're fighting one goblin sometimes it's two sometimes it's actually up to three and to me, that was a lot of fun because, you know, if you're fighting one, fine, you, you're probably going to win if you've built up your hero at all. Uh, but if you get up to three sometimes, that could be a perilous fight. And it was the same thing in Quest for Glory 2. So sometimes, you know, you'd fight only one Jackal Wear, for example, but sometimes there would be like three or four of them. And I thought that was really, really cool, especially in Quest for Glory 2, because like the Jackal Wears, when you fought fought them if there was multiple sometimes there would be like jackalware in the back and it looks like they're basically cheering on their companions like they're you know like fist bumping in the air and stuff like that and i thought that was really really cool i thought that was great so um that is something that is not in quest for glory 3 nowhere in quest for glory 3 are you going to actually fight multiple enemies at one time um I'm very glad that you can't fight the, the leopard people multiple because they're a pain already because they hit you with magic long before you get to them. Um, or you never get to them because they're just blasting you from magic and they're somewhere in the bushes that you can't even see to try to even get to them. <laughs> but it would have been kind of cool, for example, like there is, I'm just going to call them lizard people. They kind of almost look like crocodiles in a way. Um, humanoid crocodiles. But to me, I always call them lizard people because there are lizard people in D&D. Um, so it would have been kind of cool if the lizard people was an option to show multiple, like even if it was just two, like where you're fighting the one guy and you can kind of see another guy in the background. Um, that was so that was something that I kind of missed. I wish there were sometimes uh, multiple enemies of things to fight in Quest for Glory 3 or like multiple of those um, ant creatures, and stuff like that. So that was something that I do wish was in the games um like i said with the uh, the leopard people they were <laughs> if you encountered them in the jungle they could be almost impossible to see because there were times i was walking through the jungle and i'm just suddenly getting hit by spells but when i'm looking on the screen i don't see this leopard person anywhere i cannot see them i just see spells coming through trees and bushes hitting me and so I'd be running up and down and suddenly I'd go into the next screen and the spells are still hitting me. And I'm like, I, I can't even see where you're at. You know, I have no idea where these spells are coming from. So a lot of times I'd end up being killed because I couldn't even see the enemy uh, in the jungle. So that was that was a little bit of a pain. Um, something that I thought was really, really great <laughs> is because I, I do enjoy building up my stats. Like if I am doing the fighter paladin type of thing, I'm building up strength and weapon use and parry and dodge and oftentimes throwing because throwing is such an easy skill to build up like from quest for glory 2 you can just pick up rocks and just start chucking rocks and it's the same thing in quest for glory 3 i think you can even do it in quest for glory 1 i'm pretty sure you can i just don't remember doing it um, but in quest for glory 3 i was building up my throwing constantly so i'd either be throwing the spear or throwing rocks and it got to the point where i could pick up a bunch of rocks and when enemies were coming at me I could kill them by throwing rocks before they ever reached me. This was most commonly commonly seen with the ants because they're extremely slow when they move. If they're coming at you from the side, if they're coming at you from below or above, um, because they're coming at from coming at you from above, they're often quite small, so it's hard to target. Or if they're coming at you from below, they're almost already right on top of you. But if they're coming at you from the left or the right, you have so much time to basically throw rocks at them and kill them off. You could technically even throw rocks, run to the next green stop, throw rocks and do that. But I was able to just basically chuck rocks until they die. And a lot of times, even with the dinosaur, I'd just throw a bunch of rocks at him and then um, essentially bring him down in health so that when he got to me, instead of always outright attacking him, sometimes I would just hit parry, 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 and I just, I would spam the parry button or the dodge button to build up that skill because I already know he's already partially damaged. I just need to take a few more hits and kill him. Or sometimes the way that the game was running so quickly is that I could literally click attack like 10 times and you would see him swing 10 times, but then the creature's health isn't dropping 
as quickly as my attacks are happening. So I was able to hit parry and dodge while not even attacking him, and you'll see the creature is just bleeding out essentially from my actual previous attacks. So that was another way I was able to build up my parry and dodge very easily by doing that. Now the one thing that is a little bit odd, now to be fair, I've played Quest for Glory 5. Um, I don't recall ever beating it. So whatever the ending is for Quest for Glory 5, I do not know what it is. I barely even remember Quest for Glory 5. But what it is odd, and this game in a way, is sort of like Leash Suit Larry 3, right? Because at the end of Leash Suit Larry 3, um, Larry Laffer finds Patty, the love of his life. Life is good. Where do you go from here, right, for Larry? Because, you know, he's found the love of his life. There is no more reason for Larry to beat Larry. We skip Leash Suit Larry 4 and we go to Larry 5 and Larry isn't with Patty anymore. And you find out Patty isn't with Larry and there's a whole two separate things happening. I feel like Quest for Glory 3 kind of did the same thing. Because if you win the contest and then you do the bride price thing, if you play a fighter or a paladin, um, it does certainly look like there is a relationship to be had there. Because you can, when you reach her village, you can click on her to kiss her and stuff like that when she says, is all you ever do talk about romance? Which I thought was weird because she seemed pretty angry and bitter. I mean, he did give her gifts to woo her, but she was pretty easy to woo from being so angry before that when you reach the village, you're able to kiss her and stuff like that. And it really feels like there is something there. But I have a feeling the reason they did that, right, is because I think if you do the mage or the thief, and I don't know because I've not done the mage or thief in so long for Quest for Glory 3, I primarily played Quest for Glory 1, like, a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. Quest for Glory 2 I often did not play because of requiring the map and always having to turn the map when I was trying to get to the money changer so that I can make my way back to the guy selling the magic map. Um, Quest for Glory 2 was a pain. Like, I get why they did the copy protection, uh, but man, the, the way the perception changes when you walk, like, you know, that I talked about in Quest for Glory 2. You can watch that if you want to see it. But that perception of how it changed and stuff like that made using that even with the map even with the map it made it like such a nightmare to try to be like okay now i gotta turn the map i gotta turn the map again because now i've just walked down the hallway and made this left gotta turn the map again uh so quest for glory 2 i did not play that often I, you know and honestly i do not know why i did not play quest for glory 3 more often um because like i said this is actually i actually liked it more than quest for glory 2. um i loved quest for glory 2 like after after the map thing, and I got the money changer, and I got the magic map and stuff like that, Quest for Glory 2 opened up to be way more enjoyable. But prior to playing it for the channel, I just remembered how much I disliked the map uh, for the copy protection. I like strongly disliked it. I would have much rather had, you have to type this word on this paragraph, but I know that was probably easier to crack because people would photocopy the manuals or just do whatever to get around it. So I get that needing the map was probably more difficult, although you could, I guess you could just scan the map and then post it online, like on the internet back in the day on a forum or a BBS, Pfft, whatever. Um, but yeah, Quest for Glory 2, that map was always such a roadblock for me because of my sheer dislike of always constantly turning that map to try to figure out where the heck I'm going, especially even when I was trying to find out where to go from place to place it was easier just to teleport to a certain you know um courtyard i guess you could say and that's within the city and just kind of get lost from there and hope you find your way there without having to always resort to the map uh, and that's so funny for me to say because i literally grew up on an rpg called wizardry and if you've ever played the original couple of wizardry games they did not have an auto map feature like i think in wizardry five they finally kind of put in a map feature uh, but wizardry one two three and four you had a nice piece of graph paper and you were making your own map so it's kind of funny for me to complain in hindsight <laughs> about the map in quest for glory 2 when back in the day i literally used to use graph paper to make my own map to walk around in wizardry <laughs> uh let's see what else do i got Honestly, I think that's about it. Um, 
this is going to be a much shorter video. I mean, the original play is nine hours long, um, nine hours and some change. So as you can see, it's clearly way sped up because usually in the commentary versions, I don't want to talk about a game for nine hours. And I don't know if I could talk about a game for nine hours. And I don't know if anyone wants to listen to me talk at all. Literally, li uh, I mean, let alone for nine hours. Most people can't even tolerate nine minutes of me. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I have talked quite a bit. I think I've got something like almost like 15 minutes of me rambling about the various things in Quest for Glory 3. Again, I truly enjoyed Quest for Glory 3. Yes, I was very, 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 very fed up with the bugs and stuff like that that I hit. But overall, I thought the story and the options that you are presented throughout the game were much better than Quest for Glory 2. I really felt like this game pulled me in more than it did Quest for Glory, th or Quest for Glory 2. It's hard for me to ever compare Quest for Glory 1 because it doesn't really have... Um, it doesn't have like any copy protection in the beginning like Quest for Glory 2 did. Um, it was the first... I mean, I played it as Heroes Quest. I still have the Heroes Quest box and all that stuff. So that was like my first exposure to the quote-unquote Heroes Quest slash Quest for Glory series. And so that always is going to make it very special to me. Um, so it's difficult to compare to the first one because the first one to me was very groundbreaking. That it was a Sierra game. But you had stats that increased and you could, you know, put points at the very beginning to build a character that you want to build. So that was a very, very different and very, very great game to me. So it's hard to compare Quest for Glory 1. But I would say so far right now, because um, I'm not going to rate Quest for Glory 4 or 5 yet, because it has been a while since I've played 4 even. Um, I don't even know the last time I played 5. Probably when it first came out. Not even kidding. I cannot remember anything about Quest for Glory 5. <laughs> I have it. I had it when it came out. I have no idea why I never played it. I don't know if my computer back then couldn't play it. Uh, my first computer back in the day was an amazing Tandy 1000 SX. and I used to say it was a Tandy 1000 SUX because uh, it didn't even have a hard drive. And the disk drives were low density drives. Yeah, back then there was a difference between low density and high density drives, people. Most of you don't probably don't even know what a disk drive is. It's not the CD-ROM. <laughs> um, but yeah, so right now, in terms of Quest for Glory 1, 2, and 3, I would probably make it Quest for Glory 1, Quest for Glory 3, then Quest for Glory 2, in terms of how much I enjoyed them. So anyway, once again, I already know I already said this. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. If you enjoyed this, or even if you didn't enjoy it, you know what? Even if you didn't like it, go ahead and click the like button anyway. Uh, and then go ahead and hit subscribe because I might do a video you might like, or if you have any suggestions or any comments or any feedback, um, someone left feedback. Um, sorry, I don't remember your name. Someone left feedback on one of my Torrance Passage. I think it was a Torrance Passage commentary about how my voice was too loud. Like there was popping sounds in the recording and then, you know, it was sounded like crap, whatever. You know what? I, I took that criticism and I said, hey, you know, I get it. I'm right now, I'm just literally using um, a headset with a mic. So I can't move my mic away or closer. I have a feeling that when I did the audio for Torn's Passage, I may have upped my volume a little bit too much. I did not hear as many pops and cracks as they heard. And I played it from two different machines to make sure it wasn't just like, hey, it's my Bluetooth speaker, sounds fine, but over here on this machine, oh no, I hear it. There was a few pops I could hear where my voice was um, loud, so you'd hear a loud pop when I said something. But it was hardly um, as much as what they were saying but they may have a, a much better, you know, they might have a cool stereo system that it has like surround sound. So it's coming at them at every direction or something. I don't know. But I explained, you know, I do have like basically a pro mic setup. However, that thing to set up is a beast. Um, it requires putting a thing in between my computer to record through these special mics. And then those mics, I need to amplify the sound because the way it records the channels, I have to do all this crazy stuff. So I used that for my other show that I do. Um, if you look up Never Ending Nights, which is a machinima series I did, I wrote and voiced the main one of the main characters, and I did a bunch of extra voices in that series. You can tell I used a different mic set with that. Like the first 
10 episodes, we were using just a cheap mic. But once we realized it's something we want to keep doing, I ended up buying a pro mic set that I now have and it has a pop guard and all that other stuff that would help prevent making those sounds. And I may at some point try to set up something a little more intricate, but right now in this house that I'm renting, it is the room that I have as my man cave is a small room. It is clearly looks to be what was probably a very young child's room at one time. It doesn't have a lot of room and I have way too many Star Wars Lego set up that take up a bunch of the room. So I don't have a, a lot of space. My computer's literally shoved into this tiny little corner. Um, but who knows if I had a thousand subscribers and I can monetize this, maybe I can get buy a more modern type of setup. Cause that pro mic setup that I have with the USB thing that inter interacts between the computer and the actual mics it records from is like from what, 2002, 2003? when we started doing the Never Ending Night series. So it is pretty old and outdated. Um, so who knows? Anyway, I'm gonna say it for the third time. If you've enjoyed this video, or even if you haven't, go ahead and click the like and subscribe button. Feel free to share it. So if you didn't like it, say, you know what? Check out this guy's video and how horrible it is and post about it. If you liked it, post about it, say, check out this video. It's so cool. Um, and anyway, like, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. It really helps me it helps the channel and uh yeah i'm i promise i'm gonna shut up now like and subscribe please all right bye